concept that I want to talk about um, that I probably should have talked about first, but we'll just push that at the end because it really doesn't matter the order. Um, but we'll come back to that next week. Uh, so we, I doubt we'll have time today. If we do, we do. But anyhow, um, the, the discussion that we, we kind of got into last time, you know, we started talking about Eclipse and using an IDE and all that and creating packages and, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the things we talked about, though, towards the end is we, we created a runnable jar file. And then that got into the discussion of deployment. Um, deployment means getting your code into the hands of the people to use it. All right? And there's a number of options, and they all offer advantages and disadvantages, of course. There's security issues with all of them. There is timing issues with all of them, and so on. First of all, you know, in terms of what are the different ways that you can get Java code into the hands of the people that are going to use it. One way, of course, is through an Android application, all right? And you can download then to, a, uh, to, the, to the games, you know, through the, the Google Play Store, and you can download the application and et cetera. Um, if it's something that you don't want available to the public, you could distribute it through the uh, intranet, uh, through your own intranet. That's one sort of nice advantage of Android over um, iPhone is it's very difficult to, to uh, download like code. How do I want to say it? It's difficult to download code to even your own device um, that you write uh, if you're uh, an Apple developer. Whereas with Android, you could simply download a APK file, which is the compiled file, and you'd be ready to go. So you could put it on your companies with a link. Only thing you'd have to do is you'd have to tell people to um, um, change their permissions to be able to al allow the downloading of something not from the Google Play Store. Um, if any of you have ever done that, it's, it's, you know, it, it should be pretty clear. Um, not that big of a deal. So we're not really going to talk about that. All right? We are going to talk about other means of getting your code into the hands of the people that you want that want to use it. And they vary according to a couple things. what the client needs on their machine. And if there's any server needed. And what the requirements of the server are for these. Oh, we're back to this nonsense again, are we? So. There we go. So let's write, I actually meant to write these next to each other. So let's flip this sheet of paper around and say, we're going to show the method, what we need on the client, and what we need on the server. So one way is to have the app installed on client. To do that, that has probably the maximum requirements uh, on the client because it requires you to have both the app itself, which could be jars, typically is going to be jars, like the one that we created last time, plus you need the Java runtime environment. All right. For the server, there simply needs to be a way for the client to download. So you can download the application from the, the server. You would then put it on your machine, and you could run it. And you'd also need any sort of database server services. And in the case of some applications, you might need database stuff on the client as well. So that is sort of heavily uh, involved. Um, sometimes when they talk about clients, they talk about thick clients versus thin clients. What we talk about when we say thick and thin clients is what are the requirements on the client. If there's not many requirements on the client, it's said to be a thin client. All right. 
the next one, I guess it's the next one that we're going to consider, would be like the thinnest of all possible clients. All right? This would probably be, in this context anyhow, would be the thickest of all possible clients, because you actually need a copy of the, the application running locally all right, on the machine. So you need to download all that stuff, plus you need a Java runtime engine. So that's demands that you place on the client. Again, determines if it's thick or thin. All right? So that we kind of saw in the example we did last time. An example of a thin client would be a web application. And this would be using server-side scripting, uh, much like you do in the ASP.NET class, for any of you that are taking or have taken that. The difference being is that the language of choice, instead of being the ASP.NET platform and being um, using ASP.NET controls and using C Sharp, you'd be using Java. All right? I'm going to go over this overview of stuff first so that we can look at all the, all the ones that I'm going to talk about. And then we'll go and, and drill down and talk about some of them in more detail and in some cases maybe even see an example. All right? This is a thin client. In other words, all you need is a web browser. That's virtually no demand at all on the client, right? Because what machine doesn't have a web browser? I mean, I'd be surprised if your microwave doesn't have a web browser installed somewhere on it. You just don't know where it is, right? So saying that the requirement is that you have a web browser really isn't much of a requirement. So that is a thin client. Now again, what does that sort of mean? These two go hand in hand, right? Less on the client means more on the server. So the server then would need a web server that was set up for Java and again database resources and would need either JSP or servlets. These technologies are real similar. It's kind of two ways to get to the same goal. Both of them are a mix of HTML and Java code. Uh, both of them, again, the idea is, is that the client makes a request to the server through the internet. Instead of having some pre-written HTML pages sitting out there waiting, like plain old static web pages, web pages that don't change, you're going to have some code, some Java code. Or rather, to be complete, we're going to have some mix of Java code and HTML that is going to run and probably interact with a database and custom create an HTML file that gets sent back to the client. So in that scenario, the demands on the client are very thin. You just need a web browser. All the work happens on the server side. You know, so remember um, that, um, um, how do I want to say this? You know, you know, remember, the, you know, the same amount of work has to be done. If the client ain't doing it, the server has to be doing it. If the server ain't doing it, then the client's doing it, right? So, I mean, sort of makes sense. Um, obviously, the more the heavy it is on the client, the more demands on the client, the harder the deployment. But you also have the possibility to run independently. You don't have to require being a connection to the server, all right, which is a plus, all right? Um, and we discussed that uh, somewhat last time. So that's sort of our second option is a web application. A third is something called Java Web Start. This, the client needs a browser, and it needs a JRE. So it's a little bit better than the app being installed natively on the machine, in that you don't have to have a copy of the app. The copy of the app lives on the web server. copy of the app lives on the web server. And when you go through a web page, you click a link that will fire up a Java application. That application gets downloaded like as needed. All right. So 
in terms of updating, if you change something with your Java code, in these two scenarios, all you have to update is the server. Because in both cases, the Java code is only coming from the server. In this case, it's running on the server and producing HTML. In this case, the application is downloaded on an as-needed basis. Every time you click on the link, it will download the app for you. So if you made a change on it, the next time you click on the link, you get the new app. Whereas in this case, if you make change to your Java code, you have to create a jar and get it to the client. All right. The other one is Java applets. And these are primarily a history lesson, because I don't think anyone uses Java applets anymore. All right. Um, I have example code, but I doubt it will work, because many browsers have security that prevent applets from running. And without going in and tweaking settings, which I don't feel like doing, uh, the bottom line is Java applets sort of got, fell out of favor. All right. I went into Canvas, and I had a resource section that I enabled that has a whole bunch of resources and discussions of these. So let's start by talking about All right. Here's a comparison with Java and Visual Studio. Here's a discussion about Java applets and things, you know, more information about it. Here's a discussion comparing Java Web Start versus application. This is something you have to do to get Java uh, Web Start to work. This is where I'm going to be interested. Now, there's a couple videos here that talk about JSP and servlets. Application server EJB and RMI are sort of all in the Java JSP servlet realm. So at this point, what I'm going to talk about is I'm going to talk about this. And I realize I haven't been showing you the screen. All right. Resources and examples. I just enabled this today. Um, there's a section about applets, a section about JNLP, which is the uh, same thing as JWS. Um, JNLP files go with Java Web Start. And then we have servlets, beans, uh, and so on. Um, that's the section we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about Java servlets and JSP pages. How many of you have done PHP coding? All right, a little bit. Um, how many of you have done ASP.NET coding? All right, a little, you know, a few people. Let's look at what an example JSP page looks like. How many of you have done the HTML coding? OK, good. What JSP is, is Here's an example. Here's a real simple JSP page, about as simple as possible. All right. Top of the page simply um, indicates that this is a, a JSP page. All right. The rest of it is HTML, except for two things. All right, There's two pieces of code on this page that are JSP as opposed to HTML. All this stuff is just your garden variety HTML. All right? This stuff, the stuff that's enclosed in these funny little tags, are JSP tags. This indicates to the web server that that's not HTML. This is Java code. Therefore, the server executes this Java code. Now, in this case, the only thing the Java code is saying to do is import the date class. OK, so it does the import. So now the server can access the date class in running this. 
The only, the second piece of this, this is JSP, is this. All right? And this is where we grab the current date and time. Keep in mind, this would be the current date and time on the server, because this code is running on the server. If we were, and again, this machine is not equipped to run JSP pages, so I can't actually show you a live example. But if we access this page on a web server, it would show us the current date and time of wherever the server was. So if the server was in, say, Australia, all right, it would show us uh, like, what would it be in Australia? Probably 12 hours difference, right? It would show us like it's 1.30 uh, on Thursday, November 30th, all right, because it would show me the date. So this is simply executing the, um, this would execute and, and show the, the, the date that was running on the server. So any code within here runs on the server and creates HTML to send back to the client. Let's look for another um, example. This is a simple page that allows us to do basic math between two numbers. We pick with the radio button if we want to add the numbers together, multiply, or divide. We enter the two numbers, and then we have a JSP that does the processing. Now again, keep in mind that I know this isn't like world-beating, um, cutting-edge programming to take and add two numbers together, but it's the concept. Typically, JSP will do you know, more intensive sort of stuff that will typically involve database access and that sort of processing. But again, you've got to walk before you can run. So in looking at this example, really what I want to do right now is to teach you the basic concept of how a JSP works. So it really doesn't matter what the JSP code is doing, so long as we can look at the anatomy of a JSP page. All right? And this would be the anatomy of the JSP page. Again, we have our imports. We can go and write some code to grab values from the form. All right. We can have our if statements to look to see if we ask to do an addition, add the two numbers. If we ask to do a multiplication, multiply the numbers. If we ask to do a division, divide the numbers, and then output the answers. All right. So that's all this code is doing. Here's what I want you to see, and keep this in mind as we go and look at Java, uh, Java servlets, all right, is that this is basically, a JSP page is basically HTML code with Java stuck in the middle of it, all right? And we use these little tags, these little declarations, to tell the server, hey, this isn't HTML, this is Java. Therefore, don't send this to the client as it is, but do some processing and send the result to the client. So that, in a nutshell, is what JSP pages are. All right? HTML code with Java code that runs on the server inserted at different places that do whatever sort of processing is required. Now here's some of the things that you have to do to run this. There is some configuration on the database on the server side to allow you to do that. There is, um, um, depending on the kind of web server you use, it will be configured in a different way. Uh, with the Apache web server, that um, is an open source web server. There's something called Tomcat that allows you to run JSP pages and Java pages. With servlets, there are application servers and all that. 
Um, if you haven't figured it out already, uh, a lot of the IT world is divided into two groups. All right? Microsoft and what? Everyone else. All right? More or less. You know, if you look at a development shop, typically they may be using Microsoft tools and products, which means they will be running the Microsoft's IIS, which is their information, Internet Information Services, I believe. So they would be using a Microsoft web server. They probably would be using uh, ASP.NET with C Sharp. Then there's everyone else, and that includes the open source community and so on. They most oftentimes would be running what's called the Apache web server, all right? And they would be using any number of other options, um, such as Java pages, such as PHP or Python. That doesn't mean that you can't run PHP on Microsoft machines, all right? But typically, if you're, you know, if you're supportive, if, if you want to use Microsoft technology, usually you use it across the board. At least that's been my experience. I mean, I, it's possible to use uh, Microsoft Web Server running some of these other tools, but typically if you're going to do that, you're going to be running ASP.NET, all right? So Java would typically be associated, if you're running Java in a web environment, that typically would be associated with the Apache web server. All right. So what then is a JSP, or I'm sorry, that was a JSP. What is a Java servlet? Here's an example of Java servlet. All right. Notice it's not an HTML file that contains Java code. It's sort of the opposite. It is a Java class which contains snippets of HTML that are going to be written to the client. This, for example, is a Hello World application. Um, and what it would do is it would create an HTML page that would output my message contained in an H1 tag. All right? So there's your HTML. HTML is sort of embedded inside of the Java code. Now, notice that this servlet extends the HTTP servlet. So my web page will extend the HTTP servlet. And I have to have certain functions. I have to have an init function. I have to have a do get function. And I have to have a destroy function. Presumably, those would be abstract methods in the ancestor. Just like regular Java, you would have to compile that servlet. And your web server would have to be configured to understand Java servlets. And that would include matching the name of the URL to the servlet. So when the URL requested, and I'm hoping you can see this, when the URL requested said, I want hello world, notice there's not hello world.html. The web server, because of this mapping, knows that hello world on the URL corresponds to the class hello world, and it would run that servlet that we have up here, and it would output the hello world in an H1 tag. All right? So the easy way to remember, and so, you know, this is a simplification, I realize, but I think it's a good simplification, is that JSP is like an HTML document with Java inside it. A servlet is like a Java class with 
HTML inside it. So JSP is like an HTML page that's souped up to include some uh, Java. And Java servlets are Java classes whose job it is to create web pages, dynamic web pages. All right. Functionally, the way that Java works um, is largely a preference of which one that you want to create because in the end, the web server sort of treats both of them the same way. When everything is said and done and these things get compiled, um, JSP pages are compiled into servlets, so they pretty much act the same way. So if you're looking at like what the performance difference would be between the two, there really isn't a terrible, terribly big difference in performance between the two because they're essentially you know, just different flavors of the same thing. Different flavors of a mix of HTML and uh, Java code. I do want to reiterate, I think I mentioned this last time, but I do want to make a point of this to remind you that we are not talking about JavaScript here. All right? This is Java code that runs on the server to dynamically create a page. JavaScript is something else. JavaScript is code that is built into the browser that allows some interactivity to the page, to the page like putting your mouse on something, make a, a menu appear or disappear. That is, again, that's something else entirely. All right, let's see if we can find another servlet example. This is basically the same one, a hello world, just a different form of it. All right, here is a, uh, a servlet to do log. Here's a servlet to do uh, logins. All right, it's kind of dumb because the user ID and password are hard coded in it, but it serves a purpose. So, what the servlet does is there's a do post which means when this is posted to. Typically, servers, servlets are either called via the do post or do get, depending on whether the data is on the query string or the data is on uh, inside the form. But what this does is after the user typed in their username and password, we grab that, those values, and we then do an if statement. And depending on whether they logged on successful or not, we display, hey, they logged in successful or they didn't. All right. So again, this is an example of a servlet. It's a Java class that contains HTML code and can be used to process HTML data. One of the big things in server-side scripting is to be able to process data from the form. All right, in other words, the user enters something, whether it be a Google search or a login or whatever, the server does something with it. Look up real quickly a form example. Good diagram. We take the data from the form, enter it in, submit it to the server, the do post or do get, depending on how it's submitted. 
will get sent, will, will, will get executed, and we create the HTML result. Excuse me. Um, here's another example again of grabbing the data from a servlet, uh, from from a form, and doing something with it. They cleverly have do some processing here. That would be the actual work of verifying it in the database, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, one thing that that uh, when you're talking about database activity, uh, and and uh, uh, you know taking data from your Java classes and saving them in the database. There are these things called EJB, which stands for Enterprise Java Beans. And I don't even begin to have the time to, to go over that in this class. It's a much more advanced topic, but I think it's a good idea that at least you hear about it and know what it's used for. It's, it's really a way of, within an application, doing some database interactivity and pulling data through the database. To make all this work requires extensive configuration on the server side, especially when you get into the EJBs. All right? So there are things called application servers that uh, can do all kinds of wonderful things if they're set up correctly. I worked on a project like this years ago. Um, and really, the programming was a fraction of the time that we spent on the project. Most of the project was making sure that our application server and web server and database servers were all talking to each other correctly. So the code was straightforward, you know. Hey, retrieve an item from the database. Eh, that's no big deal, right? Or, um, you know, or take data that they enter and save it in the database. That's not a big deal. But when you're saving it to the database using uh, an EJB, and is running through a web server and an application server and updating a database server, those things all have to talk to each other. So there's a big, big, giant configuration issue for those things. All right, the last, or not the last, but the next thing we're going to look at is the JWS, which stands for Java Web Start. Here I have an HTML document, and I hope it works. I have a link that says Launch App. I click it, and I get an error, because I didn't extract it. Thank you. Oh, I did extract it. I just didn't extract it in the right place, or I wasn't looking in the right place. Or that's my 216 class. Or it, it's right here. OK, finally. So I click that. I click Launch App. It asks me what I want to do with this file. I want to save it. Now normally, this file, if, my, if the web server was configured correctly, this would happen automatically. But I'm going to cheat and double click this. It's warning me that my Java is out of date. OK, I know that. So I'll say I'll do it later. I love these options that have a procrastination option. And I'm unable to launch the application. I don't know why. Let me look online and see if there is uh, an example that we can run. Java Web Start example.
we go. All right, here's a dynamic tree demo. I click this. I download that JNLP file. I click Save. I go and open it up. Do I want to run this application? Again, it's very sensitive because I'm, I'm opening up an executable. Therefore, there would be the potential that there could be some security issue and vulnerability. So it's making absolutely sure I want to run this, and they're not tricking me into running some application. So yes, I want to run it. Notice what I get. I get a Java application. Now, in order for this to work, I had to have the Java runtime engine on this machine. If I didn't have it, it wouldn't know what to do with this. But what happened is the jar got downloaded to this machine. The, actually, a JNLP file, which we saw, got downloaded to this machine and opened up. All right, And I now have this application that I can go and add stuff to this tree. I can add a node and remove nodes and so on. But this is a Java app that is running through Java Web Start. Uh, here's another one. And again, it doesn't start automatically, but if I click on it, it will. I have to say that I want to run it. And then here we have a weather application. Actually, I did it twice. That will show me temperatures in different places. All right, let's see how we make the magic happen. I'll refer to my example, which didn't run on this machine, probably because there's things out of date in it. But the, the techniques will be the same. If I look at my HTML file, I have a link to my JNLP file. What does my JNLP file have in it? It has something that looks like this. This is an XML file. All right. I don't believe we've talked about XML files in this class, but an XML file is a way that you can define a certain file format for storing certain data. A lot of configuration files are stored in XML files, where you give certain parameters and define stuff about the parameters, and then other applications can read it. In this case, here's the relevant thing. Here's just some information about who was the developer of this. I actually think I have to run it through the web server. Let me try that real quick. OK, my, again, my web server isn't configured to deliver those files. All right, anyhow, the XML for this guy The most relevant lines are this. The jar that it comes from is called CONV jar. All right? And if you notice, that's the name of the jar I have created here. The other thing that's relevant is I have to say what the main class is. 
Because remember, when we create a jar, we could have many, main, uh, many classes that contain a main, uh, a main method. So we have to identify, when we run this jar, which class's main method we're we interested in using. And in this case, I'm interested in using the class named first GUI. These are simply the packages that I've created the, uh, the jar in uh, with, rather. So my first GUI is in that package. Again, this is a thinner client than installing the application on my machine. On my machine. It's not as thin as using Java servlets or uh, JSP pages, but um, it's not as bad as having to download the whole application. All I have to do is make sure that I have the correct version of the JRE installed. And when I click on it, if the web server is configured correctly, um, again, I can double click, open that, and run uh, the Java application. Are there any questions about this? Um, next week, I should have information for you about the final, uh, how war will work, and so on and so forth. Next week, I really have one topic, one main topic to go over, and that is serialization. I'll also be glad to answer any questions. My plan as of now is to cover serialization on Monday. And um, that may or may not take a while, depending on how long it takes. On Wednesday, then, I plan on having a work day just for you to wrap up uh, and have the opportunity to work on your assignments, um, ask any questions you have, and so on. Um, I should post an announcement again sometime, probably over the weekend, about the final and when things are absolutely the final absolute deadline for stuff, uh, et cetera. All right. Uh, we'll see you up in lab.